On this episode of Bright Future, I discuss trickle-down economics, Bidenomics, greedflation, price hikes, minimum wage, and a possible solution, adaptive pricing. This is a political podcast that follows current events. If you like the show, please leave a like, review, and subscribe, as well as share with your friends, though maybe not with the whole family gathering at once. I'm your host, Samuel Adams, but please call me Sam, and without further ado, Let's begin this episode, which I have titled, Not Stonks. With my job promotion and shift changes, unfortunately I no longer have time to do this show every single week. I will still attempt to do it as often as I can, but there's another bump when it comes to building a regular schedule for this show. It follows current events, but the thing about newsworthy events that I find worth talking about is that they don't happen on a regular schedule. They happen whenever they happen. While I'm sure I could find inspiration to talk about something every single week, sometimes I may end up just repeating a similar sounding episode for several weeks on end, which is exactly what happened with the debt ceiling crisis. Other times, I'll just do an episode on something that I don't think is particularly worth talking about, like the Ocean Gate submersible incident or the exact process that got Speaker McCarthy the speaker position. And so I've decided that instead of running this show on a regular schedule, new episodes will come out whenever something happens that inspires me to write a wholly unique episode, rather than getting stuck in a rut of repeating a very similar episode over and over again. With that bit of housekeeping out of the way, let's begin the episode. As America got its feet under itself and ramped up to a world superpower in the early 1900s, a prevailing economic theory began to fully form. The general idea that formed in Congress was that they should give major tax cuts to the rich, those who are at the top of companies. And because of these tax cuts, those at the top would then be able to give extra money to those under them in the form of bonuses. In turn, those people would then be able to give more money down to those further down the business ladder. The money would be saved at the top and then trickled down. But this theory didn't get that name until around the 80s. Reagan, Bush, and Trump all agreed that this theory worked, and each of these presidents' tax plans gave tax cuts to all income brackets, but the biggest reductions were always given to the highest tax brackets. And yet, this theory failed. Instead of the money trickling down to the middle and lower classes, the rich simply got richer and everyone else was left behind. After all, why give the benefits to the rich to then rely on their generosity to trickle it down to the rest of society? Why not simply give the money to the rest of society? Why the middleman? Clearly, trickle-down economics does not work, and its cascading failures only became compounded after the 2008 market crash and the 2020 pandemic. And so changes were made, and the area of Bidenomics began. Biden has, of course, been touting about how great all of his Bidenomics are. All over the White House, so you can find fact sheets about how it's improving the world. And this was something that was said at one of his latest press briefings. When the president came to office, the economy was reeling and supply chains had broken down. But instead of going for a short-term fix, the president recognized that many of the challenges in our economy had been developing over a longer period of time. He rejected trickle-down economics, the theory that tax cuts at the top would trickle down, that all we needed was for government to get out of the way. That failed approach led to a pullback of private investment from key industries like semiconductors to solar, It led to a deterioration of the nation's infrastructure, and it led to a loss of a path to the middle class for too many Americans and too many communities around the country. So the president vowed to put in place a very different approach, a approach that grows the economy from the middle out and the bottom up, and that is very focused on growing our middle class. So when the pandemic was wrecking havoc on our supply chains, inflation ran into a steep climb as the process of getting foods from seller to buyer buyer became harder and more expensive. 
We needed a fast fix to both curb inflation and ensure supply was able to meet and even surpass demand. But when we needed a fast fix, President Biden decided to play the long game? Instead of a temporary fix and then following it up with something long term to prevent the scenario from happening again in the future, he took a very long approach to correcting this issue. It took three years for inflation to finally start to level out again, but now that it has, this, the statistics can't possibly be lying. Bidenomics is working, right? Well, okay, maybe. Record low unemployment at just 3.4%? It sounds pretty great until you realize that unemployment is measured based off of the percentage of the workforce that doesn't currently have a job. If the number of the people in the workforce dropped, but the number of people employed stayed the same, technically, this would cause an unemployment to go down. And I think that's what happened. The number of people in the workforce went down by about 3.4%, so instead of a 6% unemployment rate, we now have a 3% unemployment rate. Statistics don't lie, but the way they are measured absolutely can. We created 13 million jobs, but according to Georgetown University's job tracker, 23 million jobs were lost between just March and April of 2020. If you created 13 million jobs since then, we're still 10 million jobs short, and that's just for between March and April of 2020. Another wrench in the cogs of binomics is, if it's working, then why is stuff getting more expensive? I had to move into a cheaper apartment because my first apartment, which I moved into in the middle of 2020, tried to renew my rental agreement at the beginning of 2023 with a 20% price hike. With, with my medical emergency and following bills a few months prior, I would never be able to afford. The worst part is, this isn't just a me problem. Over the past two years, median rent across the entire nation has gone up by 18%. Across the entire nation, average rent prices by, went up by at least 10% in all but four counties, with an average of 18% increase. Rent isn't the only thing that's getting prohibitively expensive. According to the Government Accountability Office, Food prices used to have an average 2% increase per year between 2010 and 2020, but from 2020 to 2023, food has instead had an 8% average price increase per year. The following is a theory. When the pandemic hit, supply chains broke and supply fell while demand remained the same, causing a price increase. That part's true. But then, people still buy. Suddenly, many companies, especially the largest ones, come to the realization that they can do something that never would have been possible even just 30 years ago. Because the market has consolidated from many, many different companies into just a few smaller companies, rather than a wide variety of competitors, they can price gouge with absolutely no consequences while still paying their employees exactly the same. The supply chains get fixed as society adjusts to living in a pandemic, the supply goes back up, and demand remains the same. Normally, supply going up and demand remaining the same would cause the price to go down, but if people bought at the higher price, why would you ever set the price back down? Or better yet, why not bring the price even higher? Gouge the prices and don't increase your employees' wages to match. Just pocket the difference and cheer about your record corporate profits. Instead of helping your employees more, help yourself to a larger slice of the economy cake. This theory is called greedflation, and I'd like to put forth my own title on it. Trickle Up Economics, where those at the top effectively squeezed the middle and lower classes like a sponge and soaked up all their money causing a major economic shift upwards for everyone. I am not an economist or an economy expert, so take all I say with a grain of salt, but I do have an opinion, an idea, about how this economic upheaval could be changed or reversed in order to better benefit as many people as possible. Let's talk about minimum wage. 
in my mind, the idea of minimum wage should be to ensure that the average person should be paid enough to be able to cover all of their expenses like electricity, water, and rent or a mortgage, save for retirement, and also be able to purchase some luxury items while also not needing to work so excessively that they have no time for anything else. A 40-hour work week with time off for leisure activities and hobbies. Ideally, a minimum wage would also enable every adult to be able to raise at least two children as well. A happy and healthy society will need to plan for the future. Minimum wage officially became law in 1938 in an effort to end sweatshops and unsafe working conditions, as well as establish a living wage. At the time, it was set at a whopping 25 cents an hour. Don't have an inflation calculator handy? Don't worry, I've got you. That's equivalent to $5.40 per hour in 2023's money. Since then, federal minimum wage has increased nine times, but its purchasing power actually peaked in 1968 when it was set to $1.60 per hour, which would be equivalent to $14.04 in today's money. Most recently, federal minimum wages increased to $7.25 an hour in 2009. That's right, last time minimum wages increased, I was in elementary school. Minimum wage has been increased nine times since 1938, and this stretch right now, from 2009 to 2023, is the longest stretch of time that federal minimum wage has ever gone without being increased. And to be honest, I think I'd be hard-pressed to find an employer who still only pays a minimum wage anywhere in the United States. Over half of the states have increased their local minimum wages, with the highest local wage being Washington, D.C. at $17 an hour. And I strongly believe that minimum wage should be increased, to at least $14 per hour so it has the same purchasing power as it did back in 1968. Hold on, though. Won't increasing minimum wage force employers and businesses to increase their costs to properly pay their workers? It's a logical theory, but in practice it doesn't actually hold up. Minimum wage, again, has increased nine times since 1938, and historically, across all of those increases, a 10% increase in minimum wage led to a 0.3% increase in inflation. That's practically a rounding error. But despite this fact, corporations may try to use the we have to pay our workers higher wages so we have to charge you more argument. So in order to avoid that altogether, I think that minimum wage should be tied to inflation. So if inflation drives the value of the dollar down by 5%, minimum wage would also go up by 5% in order to keep the same amount of purchasing power. If I were president, my Uncle Sam's economics would increase the federal minimum wage to $14 per hour, as well as tying it to inflation, but it's not the only thing my policy would include. Trickle-down economics worked on the theory that tax cuts to the top income brackets would let those top earners trickle down the savings to employees under them. I would simply cut out the middleman and just cut taxes on the lower brackets and raise them on the higher brackets, like we should. Oh, and don't forget to increase the budget for the Internal Revenue Service. They need to be able to ensure that Uncle Sam gets the money he's owed from rich tax cheats, and to do that, they need the power and money to audit those most adept at hiding their income. But me becoming president and being able to enact this economic policy is a pretty slim chance, especially considering that I don't want that kind of stressful job. My current job is stressful enough. Instead, there may be a solution from the private sector. If you've ever played a video game from a AAA developer in the past few years, you've probably seen microtransactions. If you've paid attention to gaming news, you might have heard that sometime soon, these transactions and in-game items could be different prices for different people. Basically, you buy the game and then you can buy something else that's inside the game. But those transactions, the smaller ones that you buy in the game, could be different prices for different people sometime soon. The general idea behind this adaptive pricing is that an in-game item is a digital good. It's technically limitless and costs absolutely nothing to create. There is an infinite supply. 
Because the company that makes the game wants to make money, though, they sell this digital good to the player for real money. Two different players might be willing to purchase the same item for different amounts of money, depending on a variety of factors from how cool the item is to the player's expendable income. Generally, if the amount is lower than what the player is willing to spend, then the player will buy it. But what if the game was able to predict how much a player is willing to spend on an item? Then, the game could change its price to ensure a sale, and because there's infinite supply, it's all pure profit for the development studio. And because it costs the studio nothing to make the profit, even if the game sells an in-game item for just a penny, it's still a profit. And by adjusting the price to match the player, the studio can maximize both the number of sales and the total profit. Now imagine if this wasn't limited to just games. I, on the low end of the middle class, pull up to a restaurant drive through and pay $15 for a meal, the most I'd probably be willing to spend. Then, Jeff Bezos pulls up to the same restaurant, and because he's worth a heck of a lot more than I am, the restaurant knows he's probably willing to spend more than I am. So he pays $1,500 for a similar meal. In both cases, the restaurant turns a profit because it costs them the same amount of money to make the meal. But because of their adaptive pricing, they've made a lot more profit than if they charge us both the same amount. I certainly wouldn't be willing to spend $1,500 on a meal. To a degree, something like this already exists, though there is a difference of flair. I drive a car, a 20-year-old car with no fancy features. Jeff Bezos also drives a car. Okay, multiple cars, but they are much more expensive. He drives a customized Bugatti and a customized Lamborghini. In practice, though, they accomplish the same thing that my car does. Drive from point A to point B. We were just willing to spend different amounts of money on our cars. The adaptive pricing idea is only different that, instead of buying two different types of cars, the adaptive pricing would be charging different prices for the same item. It would also only work for more subjective purchase items. The restaurant example I gave earlier only works because of the subjective value of the time and work that the restaurant takes to put the raw ingredients into a meal. It also only works because there is a base cost to the raw ingredients, so the adaptive price can only go so low before becoming a loss instead of a profit. My first thought when this idea shot into my head was, wait, wouldn't this be... Wouldn't this devalue the dollar since how much money you have changes how much you're charged for anything? And then I remembered that this adaptive pricing model already exists, and several companies operate off of it. A pay-what-you-can and pay-what-you-want models. Usually, it's charities and nonprofits that operate off of these kinds of economic models, but there are a few for-profit businesses that also use this type of pricing model. The only difference in my idea is that an algorithm tries to guess how much you want to pay by looking at your income, personal finance, habits, and hobbies, and then chooses how much you want to pay based off of that guess, instead of you paying what you want. Like I said earlier, I'm not an economic expert. I don't know what type of effect this algorithm would have on the economy, but my hope would be that it would shrink the wage gap. If we can implement strategies to shrink the wage gap and increase the income and quality of everyone in the nation, maybe we will have a brighter future. There's no one else in the voice channel this week, but if you would like to share your own perspectives on this or other topics in the future, Please join our Discord server, where I record these episodes live. It's linked in the description. Also in the description is more information, including the resources I use to build this episode, and all the places where you can find my podcast. If you would like to support the show, please follow and subscribe, leave a like and review, as well as share with your friends. Thank you for listening to this episode of Bright Future. These, re- these episodes are recorded... Follow... Or... It's tripping me up. Changing my release schedule is tripping me up because I also have to change my outro. These episodes are released following current events to check back regularly for new episodes. And hey, Nebraska state legislatures. 
Nebraska's minimum wage is $10.50 an hour, and that was set back in January of 2023. But several other states still beat our hourly wage. Y'all are going to let these bicameral legislators legislatures show up our unicameral one? Come on.